So we're going to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Shannon Martino. She's from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her paper is a quantitative method for the creation of typologies for qualitatively described objects, a case study of prehistoric figurines from Anatolia and southeastern Europe. Hello, um, thank you, and um, I hope that all the slides work uh, because I'm going from a PC to a Mac. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and begin. Um, as you can see, I slightly shortened my uh, title <laughs> because um, I'm really talking about two case studies. So um, typologies are fraught with subjectivity no matter how objective we try to be. In our natural attempt to determine patterns and similarity, uh, certain characteristics come to be considered more important than others. We attempt to find patterns even when they may not exist, um, as this famous quote uh, by Lewis Carroll illustrates. We must ask ourselves, however, not what is important, but what could be, and be brutally honest about what we see. If we are not careful, we might be view what might be viewed as a significant factor to us, but not to the producer of an object, could be heavily influential in the creation of a typology. The aspects of an object's production could be unnecessarily sidelined in favor of decoration and presumed use. When we look at an object, we must endeavor to see both the duck and the rabbit. When creating a typology, as much as we would like to ignore how the sausages are made, the methodology behind the typology should be as clear as the linkages that eventually arise from its completion. Without a clear system of analysis, all typologies would be leaps of faith and intuition. While intuition often leads to discovery, a scientific argument builds on such an intuition, shows how the linkage is possible and therefore arguable, rather than entirely subjective. Because the reasoning from points A to Z is clear, the whole is clear. <coughs> Here we will present uh, two case studies, one where we are confronted with creating a typology for the database of figurines, and one where we compare our typological analysis to one created without the aid of a computer program for a set of ceramics. The first step to any typological analysis is the creation of a database. I chose to compare uh, late Calcolithic and early Bronze Age clay anthropomorphic figurines from Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey, creating a FileMaker database of almost 2,000 figurines. A bit overwhelmed by the breadth and size of my data set, I sought to find a way to analyze the set using a computer program. At its most basic, I hoped that the program would allow me to easily and quickly compare the presence or absence of attributes among the figurines in my database. It would also allow me to create a more objective typology. In the interest of reducing subjectivity in our analysis, uh, archaeologists have used various methods from the statistical sciences. Multivariate analysis in particular is useful for the categorization of large amounts of data information, able to determine multiple variables that link different groups of data. Multivariate analysis, however, is not just one tool that is easily employed by everyone for their purposes. Rather, it is a general description for a type of analysis that takes many forms, and one must always adapt to the material which they wish to analyze. Furthermore, such statistical methods were created for quantitative analyses and have traditionally placed more value on certain characteristics of the archaeological artifact. Analyses of ancient figurines have often utilized multivariate analysis to elucidate connections between types of figurines. Weinberg was the first scholar to use attribute analysis in order to compare figurines in 1951. Brad Bartle's 1981 article introduced a multivariate attribute analysis approach in the study of figurines, which correlated and measured the strength of relationships among the attributes. The attributes he included in his factor analysis were mostly stylistic, but they also included clay and posture. His list of attributes and methodology were a starting point for the one used in my study. Unfortunately, the program he used in his study was not done on a modern computer, used punch cards, and is lost to us today. In 1995, Peter Beale used an attribute analysis approach in his study of Gradeshnitsa figurines in order to determine whether designs were chosen based on their location on the body of a figure. <coughs> it was his interest in combining an analysis of the location of attributes with description of the attributes that informed much of the creation of my database. What characterizes all these previous studies, as well as my own, is the large amount of data. 
those of us who deal with big data are drawn to methods that naturally involve the mathematical approaches that necessitate computing power. For our attribute analysis, I recorded the presence of about 300 independent attributes that characterize the technological as well as iconographic features of figurines. Um, and you obviously can't see all the words, but <laughs> I promise you they're actual words. Um, this is just sort of a, um, a, vert, a part of the database itself. Rather than imposing a preconceived cluster of attributes, I have developed a series of largely independent attributes that allow significant clusters of features to emerge. In this way, what might be viewed as a significant factor to us, but not to the producer of an artifact, would not be as heavily influential in the creation of a class. The subjectivity of this analysis will still be the subject of debate for anyone who disagrees, for example, with what might be considered a nose or arms, but as long as the observer is consistent, there will be consistency in the assessment of what it means to have arms. Um, so here you can see um, a, sort of a, a close-up of what one of these sections looks like of the arm description. Recognizing the surface level knowledge I have of statistical techniques, and given the unpublished nature of earlier programs, I turned to Dr. Matthew Martino, sitting right here in case you have further questions later, um, to help me design a program. Uh, his background in programming comes from a long interest in the subject, as well as his use of it in the pursuit of his PhD in astrophysics. Since he was usually tasked with modeling the movement of galaxy clusters, I assumed this would be a simple task. But in our collaboration, I realized many difficulties in analyzing the qualitative data usually examined in regards to figurines. The program, written by Dr. Martino and myself, um, was done in an iterative process. That is, uh, Dr. Martino was responsible for writing the code of the program in C++, um, and then we worked together, beginning with the goal in mind to create classes based on similarity. But determining how to gauge similarity required us to test the program several times to see what results various algorithms would obtain. So a large portion of the development of the program was spent refining and modifying the algorithms that it used to define classes. Eventually, we settled on the procedure outlined below that used a particular type of multivariate analysis known as cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is effectively the creation of subgroups of a data set using some algorithm. We used a hierarchical clustering algorithm that made clusters or typologies by considering how similar objects were to each other in a quantitative fashion and grouping close objects into the same type. The method we used to determine how similar ob objects were is called metric scaling. This is done by considering each item as a point in a multidimensional space and calculating the distance between the points using a metric, just as you can find the distance between points on a map. Um, as has been noted, there is a problem with this method. The connection between objects and variables is broken. It isn't possible to see the contribution of the individual variables to the analysis. This problem can, however, be overcome by an examination of the objects when the set of objects is confined to a single item, for example, figurines, pottery, or lithics. We also address this concern with the final output of our program, which makes the variables clearer by constructing a representative item based on the characteristics of the items in a given cluster. Why, then, have these approaches not been used more widely? One explanation might be found in the battle over the use of statistical techniques to determine types in archaeology that marked the arrival of newer processual archaeology and the staunch belief in the objectivity of its methods. This conflict is epitomized in the back and forth between the archaeologists James Ford and Albert Spaulding in the early 1950s regarding its use. It is an argument that almost always appears in relationship to the use of new technologies in archaeology that states that when using technology, one divorces oneself from the data to such an extent that the context of the data and knowledge that precedes the analysis is superseded by the results of the analysis. And often the arguments on one side or the other become heated. Though to many of us, Ford's rejection of Spalding's methods might seem out of place today, he is correct to remind us as archaeologists not to divorce our cultural knowledge from statistical analysis. That is why it's so essential that an archaeologist with the knowledge of the material either learn to do the analyses themselves or work closely in developing the technology. In that vein, we bring you our collaborative efforts, and if you're interested in learning to use our methods, we would be happy to teach you and make our program available to you. 
The creation of typologies used in this study follows a consistent protocol. First, the two most similar objects are determined by the program based on the number of shared attributes. For the sake of the computer analysis, each attribute is given a number determining its presence, one for present, zero for not present, and 0.5 for unclear. Then one determines a difference parameter. That is a number which defines the number of possible ways one object can differ from another. One adds objects to the first two to create a core by adding all objects that differ from the two original objects by no more than half the difference parameter. Which objects are in the core of a class is tracked so that an object that is in the core of one class is not in the core of any other class. The class is then filled out by adding all objects that differ from the core by no more than the total difference parameter. This can lead to uh, some overlap between classes. This process is repeated until no objects remain that are similar enough to create a core. In the end, there remain some figurines which are too difficult to place in a single class. These are unavoidable outliers that appear clearly in the program output. The order of appearance in the class is the input in the output of the program indicates the cohesiveness of a class because the most similar pairs of objects are the first to be identified. Thus, every successive class is more diverse than the first. The number of classes created when following this protocol is directly dependent upon this number. Objects in a class cannot differ from at least one other object by more than the difference parameter. This does not mean that all objects have the same shared attributes. When the difference parameter is decreased, objects will be more similar. When the difference parameter is increased, less similar objects will be placed together. It is the degree of similarity that creates the classes, and remarkably for different values, there are distinct de defined classes. This is remarkable in that one might assume that this method would see uh, all of these objects come together into the same group. Um, this happens when your difference parameter is large enough. Um, however, even for a difference parameter as high as 10 for these figurines, not all fell into the same group. Finally, for figurines, especially ones as fragmentary as we had, we had to run three separate sets in order to determine the best classes for the top, middle, and bottom sections of each figurine. The following is one example of the program's application and the possibilities it affords through multiple analysis. Using a difference parameter of two on the figurines from the site of Demir Jahir, three bottom groups were defined. When the difference parameter is increased to four, middle groups appear among the Demir Jahir assemblage. With a difference parameter of six, the first top group appears. At a difference parameter of 10, three group top groups of similar design appear, and at a difference parameter of 12, heads with a headdress appear. This analysis shows that the top sections are more diverse than the bottoms or middles in their design, illustrating that greater attention was given to or license was allowed for the heads, especially to the facial features. The results of the analysis suggest two additional things. First, the primary marker of this class for the bottom section is posture, for this distinguishes the subclasses from each other and excludes uh, seated figurines. As the difference parameters increased, however, these markers are quickly begin to become irrelevant while seated figurines remain in an entirely separate class. Just as with the figurines, I thought this, the ceramic data from the Western Anatolian site of Demirjahirik was worth pursuing because it was robustly published by Jürgen Sayer. In order to work with a similar data set, around 50 examples, I limited my analysis to the cups and bowls from the early Bronze Age levels H to M. The 11 attributes we chose to examine were based on an analysis of how Sayer organized his cups and bowls into forms. Uh, here you can see them here uh, and how we've uh, weighted them, um, given them more priority than some others. Sayer created types based almost solely on form, um, and decoration and handle types were not considered. Therefore, in our analysis, we weighted information about the presence of a handle less than all the other characteristics. Our goal was to come up with the uh, exact same groups, the major difficulty being that Sayer's publication does not make the descriptions of his groups uh, very clear, so determining <coughs> the characteristics of each group is difficult. For example, uh, these two images um, are to scale, uh, and what distinguishes the bowl from the cup is not entirely clear, except that perhaps the handles of this type uh, may preclude this piece from being a cup. Other problems include interpretations of the rim angle, which were difficult to make based simply on drawings in a book. Uh, given that all the groups were pretty, given that, however, all the groups were pretty consistent in our output. Uh, first, a note on the program and its use particularly for ceramics. 
Comparing quantitative information such as diameter uh, is done by subtracting numbers and taking the absolute value of the difference so that numbers like 12 and 12.75 are really only um, 0.75 different from each other. Um, so only like three quarters of one of these different parameter units. The results uh, were designed to be output from the program using unique identifiers for each object, so those identifiers could then be searched for in one's database, database to easily identify groups, especially when the database includes images or other additional identifying information. Along with this list of objects found in each class, a list of average attributes is compiled so as to better define and refine that class. Since we do not prohibit objects from appearing in more than one class, using these average type descriptors also has the advantage of helping one to identify points of comparison with other classes when one object fits into two classes. So uh, just to go through um, a couple of these here, um, this, this first group uh, was composed of vessels from these three forms. Um, with the average description showing an everted rim, um, a height to diameter ratio of 0 0.41, uh, a height of almost six centimeters, a diameter of 13.5, and roughly 75% of them had a handle. This is consistent with the fact that for Sayer, three of these forms um, should be considered, uh, could be considered cups or bowls, and for the most part, they all had everted rims. Now for the sixth group, uh, which combines uh, vessel forms three, four, and six, um, they all had an average height of six, uh, diameter of 12.75, 50% had handles, uh, and mo almost all of, all of them actually had a vertical rim. Um, all of these have a diameter that is consistent with each other, um, which may explain their overlap here, uh, and which is discussed more uh, by Sayer. But for the best ones that uh, came out of this data set, um, we have um, these groups here, the fifth group um, and the 15th group, uh, which both all had um, forms from the group six of, uh, of forms and the other group uh, which had all forms from form seven, um, which shows that um, there can be consistencies found in this data. However, uh, none of the bowls fit into a group until a difference parameter of eight, uh, which seems to confirm the validity of Sayer's typological systems that place no more than four bowls into any one type, making them um, more diverse. The classes defined by the computer analysis are cohesive, but as, as mentioned earlier, there are outlier figurines and objects that tend to appear in all the classes due the, to the simplicity of their form and their uniqueness. This situation is allowed in the analysis so as not to exclude a figurine from any class uh, simply because it has um, already appeared in another class. Such objects have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis and the results of the analyses um, have to be examined for clarity. Some objects have too few characteristics to make them easily found by the program. The lack of characteristics makes it easier for objects to appear in any class, so they ought not to be recognized for any class but the one where they are the predominant type. If you do not have consistent data, then your classes will not be consistent either. It's okay to have some missing information, but a lot of missing information means that you will have to do more interpretation of the results. The types defined may not be what you expect either. This is when you have to find out if you told the program what was important or if you left something out, or if you told the program information that wasn't important, but that information defined a group anyway. To use the program, all you need is a set of attributes, a database of your objects that can be exported to CSV format, and a set of weights that describe how important you want each of the attributes to be in the formation of classes. You should also specify whether the attributes are quantitative or qualitative. There need to be options because although this is a tool meant to remove objectivity and easy understanding of large amounts of data, that data is something that is best properly understood by those who study it. You as a scholar understand the significance of certain aspects of an object and the unavoidability or universality of others. You have to be the one to gather the data as well. It is our responsibility to gather the data well, both comprehensively and responsibly. Thank you. <laughs>